So I'm really pleased and honored to um, introduce this, uh, this last session of uh, the meeting, uh, which is about systems immunology. So this session is definitely uh, pushing the air community to explore uh, new frontiers. So as you know, the air community has been focusing mainly on uh, air data and from standardization, uh, tool and tool developments and tool um, uh, and recommendation. But as you all know, see also air are part of the as part are part of a whole uh, in the immune system, and therefore the, the this systems immunology approach is uh, quite necessary. So this afternoon we'll have uh, great talks by leaders in systems biology or systems immunology, and I would like first to introduce Atul Boot, Professor Atul Boot, um, who is a MD, a PhD, computer scientist. Um, heading um, the Bakar Computational Health Science Institute at the University of um, California, uh, San Francisco. And he is also the chief data scientist for the entire University of California health system. So please. Great, thank you very much uh, for having me here and it's great to be part of this uh, uh, immunology community. Um, I'm gonna uh, already apologize. I'm gonna run out after my talk to catch my four o'clock flight. We'll see if I am able to make it with the Uber or not. So I'm gonna order an Uber in the middle of my talk here. Uh, yeah, th this will be a new one for me too. <laughs> uh, first of all, I'm a medical doctor. So I gotta show my conflicts of interest. I have just a few. Suffice it to say, I consult for almost every major pharma biotech company. I've started my own companies. I wouldn't blame you if you didn't believe another word I said over the next 40 minutes. Uh, but I'm also proud of the company started by my students on the right there. All right, and, but maybe with this, I'll convince you this is the most amazing time to be in biomedical research and uh, innovation and entrepreneurship. All right, so we're obviously drowning in data, right? So this whole last two, two and a half days, it's been about immune, immune, immune repertoire, but there's a lot of public data sets out there and a uh, biomolecular data sets broadly defined. I'm just showing some logos here. At the UK Biobank, has a genome atlas, microbiomes, and certainly we have immunology data as well. And I'm a big fan. My whole career got launched with these uh, open, uh, big open data sets. Uh, the one, of course, I am most proud of is the one that we run uh, for NIAID called Import. Uh, you can see the link at the top there where you can right now download more than 500 different studies. I'm going to show you what we've done with some of these studies ourselves, trying to encourage you to also uh, get to this type of immunological data as well. So drug repositioning, new patient subsets, digital comparative effectiveness, much more we can do because these are clinical studies, clinical trials. In fact, this is one of the only repositories in the world. We can download raw clinical trials data from pharma. They just happen to be immunological clinical trials, right, for transplants and autoimmune diseases and things like that. So uh, uh, we run this in collaboration with uh, Periton, which used to be north of Grumman, and IED, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and March of Dimes, who also contribute data sets. Uh, if you look right now, this is as of just this morning, 550 different studies, 82,000 human subjects in there, uh, one 6.3 million results, and all sorts of different areas from vaccine response, immune response, autoimmune conditions, so transplantation, preterm birth, pregnancy, and all sorts of complications of those as well. Now, just to give you an example of some of the things we've done with this data, right? You could just take out all the transplant data, for example, and just study just transplants. In fact, the donors of the transplants, right? You've got, got the recipients, of course. What happens to the donors? Others, even that data is in there. So living donors, for example, who donate a kidney or a liver, well, this in particular happens to be kidney uh, donations. We have multiple years of follow-up of what happens to those individuals. What kind of complications do they have? Uh, for example, I did not realize that it is not that rare for kidney transplant donors to then need a kidney later in their lives. That was surprising to me. So Jiming Chen and Sachita Bhattacharya did this work. I think it came out in JAMA Network Open. There's some links at the bottom there. But one of my favorites is the 10,000 immunome project, right? So when you have tens of thousands of humans studied, you could just take all the normal and the healthy and the controls, right? We have 200 words for normal in biology, right? Normal vehicle volatile type control time zero, right? Just take all the healthy normal folks and just make a data set out of them. Now, of course, you have to do a lot of harmonization for this to work. But here in the 10,000 immunomes, 
242 different manually curated experiments. So we went through every single one of these to figure out who were the normals, who were the experimental groups. For cytof, low cytometry, secreted immune pro uh, proteins, so that's uh, immunokines. Uh, we had uh, gene expression data from uh, PBMCs and whole blood and many other ELISA measurements and things like that, all standardized using some uh, commonly used uh, uh, tools to, um, uh, to uh, correct for batch effects. And then we give all of this back to the community. We have some uh, browsing ways to look at the different uh, subsets and patients and things like that, but we give this all back as a healthy control group that you can use. Now, I know there's many groups out there, right, in the United States and in Europe, uh, who are building their own 10,000 immunome or bigger uh, immunome uh, repositories. That's the way to do it, right? To go in one big effort to get them. But until those are done, this might serve your needs as a master control group here, right? That's what the website looks like. And there's a link at the top there. And you literally just go to this website and start to click on transcriptomics or proteomes or lab tests. And then you can just dive, start to dive in deeper, but you can download all the raw data and harmonized data in one place. So what are we trying to do with all of this work? We're trying to get to precision medicine, right? How to customize the care that we're delivering to patients based on measurements we're getting from those patients, right? Of course, they're gonna be biological measurements like DNA and proteins and things like that. But actually the future for precision medicine is also behavioral measurements, preferences, right? I can tolerate this side effect. I don't want that kind of side effect, right? So it's gonna be more than that, but the idea is to customize the care we deliver to patients based on their measurements and databases we gotta compare them against. Now, it's actually been 11 years now already since this phrase precision medicine came out during the Obama administration, right? They launched all sorts of different efforts, which are still running. But the National Academy uh, came out with this report 11 years ago. It's a multi-hundred page document. I recommend reading it at some point. But to me, it comes down to this one figure, okay? The hundreds of pages down to one figure. And why I love this figure uh, is because the, the triangle tells us we're going to need a new taxonomy to think about diseases based on biology, not just what doctors see, but based on the biology of those diseases. And to do that, we need better diagnostics, we need better treatments, and we need to figure out our health outcomes, right? Those are the three ovals at the top. So for the whole rest of the talk, I'm just talking about, I'm going to talk about how we can use all this data that we've been blessed with to come up with better diagnostics, treatments, and figure out our health outcomes here. All right, so let's get to diagnostics first. What is a diagnostic, right? We have lots of companies here. We have lots of folks working in the field. A diagnostic is a way that a patient or a nurse can figure out if a patient has a disease, right? We might have imaging diagnostics. We got ELISA kits for COVID up there. That's a great diagnostic or not, who knows? Uh, but we have all sorts of diagnostics now in this world. I love blood tests, right? I love serum proteins. Uh, because they're reasonably specific, if we can get to specific ones, but it's, uh, and you, they're actually cheap to make, right? An ELISA kit doesn't take very many, many dollars or euros to make, uh, but you got to know what to make it against, right? You can't just make an ELISA kit on everything, right? You got to know what to do. And so uh, we wanted to come up with the diagnostic for this one called preeclampsia. Now, it's not really clear why people get this, but this is a disease that affects uh, pregnant women all across the world, all socioeconomic status, all races and ethnicities, and what happens is the blood pressure goes shooting high. This might be an immune component, inflammatory component, certainly a vascular component, and the mom can die, the baby can die. So we have to save these babies and mothers in a hurry, sometimes take, keeping these babies uh, that are born very early alive for months and keeping them free of infection. And obviously it takes a lot of uh, mortality, morbidity, and costs billions of dollars. So we wanted a, a test for this. Now the current test for preeclampsia is unbelievably nonspecific. It's urine, Protein, not even a specific one, right? Just how much protein is there? Uh, yeah, that is one of the most non-specific tests. Well, we have said rate, but we have very not, this is a non-specific test, if you can imagine. So we wanted to come up with a blood test for this one. So how did we do this? And all of this is in the links I'll show you. Uh, I'm not gonna spend extra time on this, but we downloaded every data set we can imagine on preeclampsia where all the gene expression data sets are hundreds of them, quality control them down to a couple dozen. And we started to chase down what are the RNA transcripts that were up in everyone's data sets, right? I didn't care if you saw it, but you didn't, right? I wanted to go out, chase the RNA, the transcriptome that was elevated in everyone's experiments. And so thinking that the RNA uh, in those tissues then were coding for proteins that I could detect in the blood, we've just bought every ELISA kit we can imagine for those transcripts and then tested those in samples. And here's an example of one hemopexin, the protein level in pink is up in preeclampsia, compared to normal healthy pregnant women, which are in green across the gestational age. We had March of Dimes funding and Spark funding. This is while I was at Stanford. Linda, Bruce, and Matt got involved. We wrote a whole bunch of papers. And then what did we do next in Silicon Valley? We started a company on this, 
So this became Carmenta uh, and immediately got $2 million in seed financing. Now I'm not showing you $2 million to brag about it, okay? As you know, $2 million is not a lot of money to raise in Silicon Valley. But what I'm gonna to try to convince you hopefully is that the science continues in the startup company, right? The next experiment we had to do after writing all these papers was a prospective multi-center trial. And that experiment will be funded by private dollars, right? Or to put it another way, do you know how hard it is to get a brand new $2 million NIH grant today? The science continues in the startup companies funded by private dollars. Now, I love this one because you can barely see at the bottom right there, this company's already been acquired. Some of you know what that means. So we went from downloading data to doing the bioinformatics, figuring out the, the RNA, chasing down the ELISAs, getting samples, validating them from the freezers, launching the company, getting funding, selling the company, start to finish, 18 months. Inventors happy, investors happy, university happy, right? And of course we can do more of these and I'm giving away the secrets here, right? Because every one of you can pick a different disease and make a diagnostic and we'd never step on each other's toes. That's how many diagnostics we need in medicine today. Everything I just explained is in the links, okay? It's all open, what we did here, right? Start to finish 18 months to selling the company. Another diagnostic we obviously just heard from Illumina is gene sequencing. Uh, we're going to be sequencing like crazy. And I'm not that old, I think. I think of myself not that old, but I still remember wandering around the Whitehead Institute, where at that time it was miraculous. We were sequencing in factory like settings with only seven or eight people staffing a pipeline like that at the Whitehead. This was even before the Broad Institute. And on the top right, there's my hand holding an Oxford nanopore, right? I mean, uh, powered by USB, right? USB powered sequencing, which is crazy in my mind. Now, I'm not saying we're going to have a sequencer in every clinic or exam room, but certainly we're going to be sequencing a lot more patients. And I hope, and I think, and I hope immune repertoire is one of those tests we should be ordering in patients today. I'm not really sure why we're still not ordering that. I mean, that's what the work is that you all are doing here, right? It's about time we start to actually use some of these tests. Now, I got started on this one, and I'm not a geneticist. Uh, but I got started because of this patient showed up one day at Stanford. This is Steve Quake. He starts sequencing companies on the side. So he's not your usual patient, but he showed up because in red, that's him in the family tree, his nephew in blue, 19 years old, suddenly died one morning, just did not wake up, sudden cardiac death. And so Steve Quake in red went to his friend, our friend and, uh, cardi uh, and colleague, Ewan Ashley, cardiologist, and said, well, doctor, am I going to die of sudden death? And doctor, here is my genome right? Now we're chuckling about this, right? It's already been 12 years and we would still laugh at this. We have not made a lot of progress in convincing a regular doctor to, or even giving them the tools to accept the genome, right? How would they even deal with us? Oh, and by the way, doctor, your next patient's already here in the waiting room. So you only have 15 minutes here to deal with this, right? So this became a prototype for us. So what are we going to do with all this data? Um, and this paper came on Lancet. I think it was one of the most highly cited papers that year. Now, this could be an hour long talk. Like you and Ashley could speak for an hour about the heart. And to be honest with you, there were no lethal mutations in genes setting up arrhythmia. So, okay, the heart was okay. And then Russ Altman could give you an hour long talk on pharmacogenomics, 150 drugs now. We can say something about if we have a genome sequence. Is it gonna work? What should the dose be? Could there be side effects? But the heart was done, the drugs were done, and my lab was stuck with all the rest of medicine. Okay, so what did we do? How do we tell Steve Quake what his risk was for disease? We started an effort back way back in 2008, realizing we needed to build a brand new database of all the different mutations in the human genome and all the diseases, right? And I know this community curates databases as well. We, we realized there were no good databases out there. There's something called the GWAS catalog, which still is not that great. So we realized we had to really reread every paper in genetics. So here's an example of just one paper. And we realized all the data in this field is locked up in publications. So we started with a San Jose high school kid that summer and gave him 50 papers to read. Now, some smart high school kid was able to read 50 papers and curate them for us. And we realized maybe we can just scale and just read every single paper in human genetics. And that's what we did. So here's one paper. Here are a thousand papers and we manually read 20,000 papers. And we hired a team in India, 200 bioinformaticians and geneticists to just read every single paper in human genetics, every supplemental table, every appendix. And I love NLP, I'm a computer scientist, NLP sucks at this, okay? There's no hope for NLP here. If you need any proof of that, 
open any one of these PDFs in Acrobat and try to copy paste the table, okay? We don't even know where to put the tabs right, right? When you do that, never mind what the columns mean. So you got to manually read every single paper in genetics. And that's what we did. We created a big database called Varimed, which is all the gene variants in medicine. And we started to use that for Steve Quake. This is the figure from the paper in 2010, uh, where um, we think our future, the way a doctor in the future is going to communicate to patients, is not based on RSID and did you have an A or a T or a C or a G there. But these are now the new computed risks for diseases. And by the way, as you get older, all the pediatric stuff goes down and all the adult stuff goes up, right? I mean, these should be changing constantly. I think that's the new world. And maybe around the edge of this figure are all the environmental factors that we should be promoting to make sure you can alter the etiology of some of these diseases. Now, this was back in 2010. Uh, obviously, genome sequencing has gone everywhere, especially in the cancer world. But what do we do in Silicon Valley? We started a company on this called Personalis. Uh, we launched, came out of stealth mode back in 2012 by doing the, by still being the, running the Million Veterans Program. We do the sequencing for that, the company. And then uh, almost exactly three years ago, right before COVID, we had our first, uh, we had our IPO. Uh, and on a good day, the company is worth a billion dollars. So this started from a San Jose high school kid reading 50 papers. Or to put it another way, do you know how hard it is to get a billion dollar NIH grant? The science continues in the startup companies funded by private dollars. We take it as far as we can in academia and then get it the hell out of the university so that families and patients and docs can benefit, right? Or as I say in my lab all the time, if you wanna change the world, you can't just keep writing papers about it, right? If you've invented something or discovered something, it's up to you to then make sure someone's licensing it. If no one's licensing it, it's up to you to start the company, right? That's what we should be doing. One more example. The drug side, my goodness, much harder to come up with new drugs. Everyone thinks it takes a billion dollars and 10 years to make a new drug, right? Maybe you've heard of that. It takes a billion dollars to make a new drug. That is an underestimate, right? The right answer, very simple, even after simple math, even after lunch, right? How much did you spend? Divide by how many drugs did you get, right? It's really simple math. How much did you spend? How much did you get? Normalizing that number. Matthew Harper does this every couple of years, at least he did when he was at Forbes. And this is back in 2013. It's only gone up since then for the top 12 companies. They spend between 3.6 billion and $11.7 billion per drug. Probably not sustainable. Now I'm not here to pass judgment on the farm industry, okay? If we don't have them, we're all, all in trouble. But boy, can't we use all that data out there to come up with better, faster, cheaper, efficient ways to come up with drugs? Maybe. And so I'm, we, I showed you all that data, all those logos. We got a lot of folks studying drugs and drug databases and diseases and disease databases. Why don't we put those two together? And we turned this crank like crazy in my lab. Uh, and where we had a lot of fun weren't the new drugs, but the new uses for the old drugs, right? Drug repositioning. We didn't invent that concept. It goes back decades. It actually goes back to World War II but why can't we use data to do that? We did a whole bunch of these. This is my favorite example of the most recent one. This is a disease called uh, liver cancer, hepatocellular carcinoma. 350,000 people a year get hepatocellular carcinoma, but very few in the United States. Now I'm not saying cause or effect here. We basically don't have any pharma companies working on liver cancer, okay? That most of these folks are in India and China who get this condition, but, and we have no pharma companies working on this. Well, we turned our crank and we came up with this drug, nicolosamide, which is a worm drug. I know we've heard of horse drugs now during COVID. This is a worm drug and uh, it's approved. Uh, and the idea here is um, maybe that will help with liver cancer. Well, what you're seeing here are mice livers with human liver cancer. The control looks pretty bad. The nicolosamide doesn't look any better, but N-E-N -E is nicolosamide ethylolamide, which is a particular salt of this thing, nicolosamide, that is orally ingestible. And you can see it looks healthier to me. Glowing cancers are smaller with NEN. And we did a synergy study, right? So here at the bottom there, you can see just drinking water control. NEN, the liver cancer seems smaller. Serafinib is the only other existing drug we have, which is not great. I think it's, uh, uh, it was a UCSF molecule licensed Onyx. I think Bayer, Bayer now owns them. Um, you can see that's better. But when you put NEN and Serafinib, it looks like there's synergy here. So maybe these drugs are working in different pathways, alternative. So if we're gonna launch a clinical trial in this one, as Bin Chen is trying to do as the lead author here, 
uh, in China, maybe we'd put NEN and serafinib together as a synergy here. We had dozens of these, and what do you do in Silicon Valley? You start a company on this. And this became Numedi, launched, uh, raised more than $10 million to date, and they're going after a particular, another nasty condition called idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis with a lung structure fibrosis. Nobody knows why. Two existing drugs for them, neither of them that good. Patients hate both of them. So maybe there's a room for a third one out there. And that's how you do it. You got it. If you're not going to do this, nobody's going to do this. And the data is sitting there waiting for you. All right. How are we doing? For, we're doing fine, good, fine for time. What's the next big data out there? Right. So that was the launch of my career. Seven years ago, I moved to University of California and I started to see another big data set coming. Electronic health record data. Oh my God, EHRs are so old, they're new again, okay? Because everyone has to put these in, at least in the United States. And boy, are they expensive. Here are three press releases, uh, copy pasted. Sutter is one of our health systems in California. They're kind of our neighbors here. We could say frenemy, right? With our friends and enemies, I suppose. Spent $1 billion on their EHR system. Partners, which is Mass General Hospital and Brigham Women's Hospital and all of their affiliates, spent $1.2 billion with their EHR system. And Kaiser uh, Permanente, which is all over the country, spent $4 billion on their EHR system. Now, amazingly, they all bought the same system, Epic. So you can imagine, boy, the price tag ranges from $1 billion to $4 billion for software. It's more than software. We got to train all the docs and train the trainers and reimagine workflows in the hospital. But boy, I call this now the most expensive data in America. We pay doctors to type all of this stuff in. So the narrative I communicate now, I hope you get, is what a national tragedy it will be if we don't use this expensive data to improve the practice of medicine. Very simple, right? Of course, we have to do it safely, responsibly, respectfully. But what a tragedy it will be if we don't use this data to improve what we're doing in medicine, right? It's unbelievably expensive. That's the whole kind of shtick now for me in my new world at UC. And with that, let me just reintroduce who we are at the University of California, right? UCSD is right down the road here. But the University of California is enormous. We have 10 campuses, three national labs, including Lawrence Livermore, which I think has the number one supercomputer uh, in the country, at least. And we run uh, those uh, national labs. 200,000 employees, who are one of the larger employers in the United States, quarter million students per year. And then we got these six medical schools, right? Six medical, and then 14 other health professional schools. So nursing, pharmacy, veterinary, dental, uh, public health schools. We train half the medical students and residents in California, $2 billion in NIH funding. So it's about 10% of the extramural budget of NIH comes to the University of California. 10% of all scientific papers written in the United States are authored by the University of California, right? 10% of all United States science comes from UC. We make $13 billion a year seeing patients. 5,000 doctors get a paycheck from us every month, but 100,000 doctors write orders on our patients. And UCSF and UCLA are in US News top 10. I only mention that when we're in the top 10. Otherwise, we don't care so much for US News and World Report. Uh, we have five NCI Comprehensive Cancer Centers, five Clinical Translation Science Awards. And then we got these secret superpowers that are so secret, we forget we have them sometimes. IRB reliance, which means if any one of our UC medical schools approves an IRB protocol, the others automatically approve it as well. Okay, so for scaling, it's crazy. Now, what that means is hours to weeks instead of weeks to years, basically, right? It still takes some time for them to approve it, but it's that magical. And so that's the University of California. And now we have this umbrella across the entire health enterprise called UC Health, all the hospitals, all the medical schools, the academic uh, health centers here. And what that, well, why we've done that is because we want to now represent ourselves as a single entity moving forward to get healthcare coming to the University of California. Now, what that means is we had to all of a sudden in a hurry start to figure out what kind of medicine are we gonna practice? UCLA takes care of transplants that way. UCSF takes care of transplants this way or pick any disease. And to figure out what the right UC way was to do it, we had to come up with a central data warehouse. And this is what we have. You see the logos at the bottom, UCSD, uh, Irvine, LA, San Francisco and Davis are massive medical centers. Riverside's our baby sibling, their brand new medical school. They don't even have a hospital yet. Okay, a couple thousand patients. The rest of these have millions of patients. Now we were happy with all of this data flowing centrally every single month until COVID hit and all the COVID data flows every single night. So from six to nine in the morning, all the data flows. Of course, all these instances of Epic, and we harmonize all of that before we put out our tweets, usually around 11 or 12 uh, in the afternoon. And that's what we have a central data warehouse. 
Now here's the latest data. Uh, it's a little bit harder to read, but I'll step you through it. We use something called OMOP. If you're into clinical data, it's a vendor neutral standard, international out there now. So I uh, love all the open source code around OMOP. Uh, we installed Epic in January of 2012. So we have 10 years of longitudinal data on a lot of folks now. 8 million patients, 310 million encounters, 875 million procedures, but my favorite, 1.1 billion drug orders and prescriptions we've written, uh, 3 billion blood tests and vital signs. Another way I like to say it is we have everything from Tylenol to CAR T cells. Tylenol is our brand name for acetaminophen, okay, the cheapest thing we could do for a patient. Of course, we're going to charge them something. All the way to CAR T cells is where we extract their immune cells, train them to fight cancer, put them back into a body. That is probably the most expensive thing we do a patient. We have everything in between, right? And we got merged with regulatory data, pathology, radiology, text, we're starting to figure out text. We also have every single death in the state of California. We happen to run that contract for Sacramento. So everyone who's died, even if they're not our patient, we know that. And we constantly harmonize them because drugs come out every single week. So we've got to harmonize all of this stuff. Uh, just to give you an example, I did this this morning. Here are just the 14.2 million lymphocyte counts, just to pick one test, okay? Now, these are lymphocytes per 100 cells, so it usually, it's supposed to range between zero and 800. You can see, I don't even know what kind of distribution this. This isn't a normal distribution. Uh, it, it is an interesting shape, uh, but you can see, so the, the Y marks go from half a million, million, 1.5 million, 2 million. I set them to be every five. Just pick any blood test. We have millions of them. Okay, millions of patients who have received everything you can imagine here, right? This, this is the new world here. Uh, first, by the way, it starts off identifiable. So we know the latitude and longitude of every home address, right? We start because we're improving care, then we de-identify for research. So at the left here, you can see the zip codes of every one of our patients, at least in this part. Uh, UCSF, UC Davis in the northern part, UC LA, Irvine, and San Diego in the southern part. There's a tiny red dot there somewhere for Riverside. And, but you can see we have patients in Los, Ange uh, Las Vegas, uh, in Phoenix, in Tucson, the Hawaiian islands are covered by our colors as well. Age, race, ethnicity, gender, primary care, what kind of pair they have. But at the bottom right there, because we can map their latitude longitude, we can then map that to a US census tract. And from that, we can figure out just the tip of the iceberg of the social determinants of health, something that wasn't covered at all here so far, right? What kind of diet might they have? What's the unemployment rate like there, right? Because you get a clue, it's not perfect, but a clue of all that based on where folks live. Um, so we can see area deprivation index, social vulnerability index, healthy places index. We can do all of those uh, as well. And we do that for all of these. Just take one disease, let's say all the cancers, here are the 100,000 cancer patients we follow uh, actively right now in the University of California. This is like as of uh, last month, as of March. Uh, again, SVI, we have advanced. So 28,000 of them are on immuno-oncology or cellular therapies, right? So we know which ones are more advanced. But because many of them get genomes, we said, why don't we just put all the genomes in here too? So we have all the cancer genomes, at least by foundation medicine. We haven't done Tempest yet. We're working on Tempest and Garden to, and our own local sequencing. But here are the 19,000 cancers that we've sequenced in the same database. Now, I just highlight this because I remember Roche purchased Flatiron and Foundation Medicine for $5 billion. Uh, we have that kind of for free now at this point. It's not as many patients that they have, uh, but any UC researcher now has nearly 20,000 cancer genomes in the same database, all the care before and after. Pick a lymphoma, pick a, a blood cancer, pick anything. So the number one gene mutated in any UC cancer is P53. No surprise there. All right, so let's dive into COVID for a moment because how do you talk about anything without COVID? Um, what a mess it was, and it still probably could be. Uh, we'll see where things go in the summer and the fall. Um, but here's my, one of my favorite uh, viz, data viz we came up with. Here, there's just the first 10,000 admissions we had for COVID. Every dot there is an admission uh, that we had in our hospitals with a COVID and a SARS-CoV-2 positive patient. The uh, x-axis is time, so from the beginning to, uh, let's say, uh, end of last year or so. And the y-axis at the top are the oldest patients, at the bottom are the youngest patients. Red indicates they died. And you can see where the reds are towards the top. And a black circle around the little disc means that they had some part of their stay in an intensive care unit. So you can see older folks died. You can see where the surges are. And most people who died in red had an intensive care episode around that. But we did a lot. We have a lot of COVID data in this mix, and you can use that for science. Let me just show you five interesting patients, because every COVID test we run is in the system. We have millions of COVID tests. I know they're giving out dozens here. 
we have millions that we've already run. Let me just show you five interesting cases, right? And we have hundreds of these. So on the, here you have from zero, moving forward about 300 days. And red means they were positive at that point and blue means they were negative. So this patient went from, this person went from negative to positive, positive, positive to negative 50 days later, positive again, negative 150 days, now positive again at 200. How many episodes of COVID did this patient have? What would you say? One, two, maybe three, right? But this is, this is the weirdness of COVID testing now, right? Uh, here's another one. Positive, 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 negative, positive, negative, positive, and then a whole bunch of negatives for another 200 days. Well, how many episodes did this one have? One, two, maybe three. Negative, negative, positive, 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 and note that this person was positive for almost 200 days, okay? 200 days. Negative for another 200 days, positive again. So how many episodes did this person have, right? Like you can be positive for that many hundreds of days. Did not kind of know that. I don't even know how to explain this one, how many positives and negatives in a row here, right? This is real world COVID testing. And then this one, I mean, this person just keeps, this one's keeping, <laughs> keeping the sequencing companies in business, I think. So many tests. Now UCSD was doing serial testing forever. I don't even know how many, did this person have any COVID episodes or were these false positives, right? This is real world COVID testing, right? Now, I don't know if you want those kits in the front here, I'm not so sure, uh, but it, this, it's this crazy. But you can use all this data, especially the serology data to actually interestingly study the serology of COVID. We had this paper out and I'm not gonna go into more detail since it's been published. So many people just get serology and this is in the pre-vaccine area, you can get very specific serology. Is it vaccinated serology or natural serology against uh, um, uh, COVID? And what we saw is even after a demonstrated positive COVID test, only about 80% max had any serology, uh, even after about 200 days. So there were many people we could already see that were getting COVID in our eyes, they had for COVID. We couldn't find any uh, serology in them uh, up to 200 days later. So you know, we, we, this is already a two-year-old paper, but I think just looking at natural data like this, we can do a lot of science. Now, it turns out we also happen to run flow cytometry, right? Flow cytometry is a clinical test. And so all the flow cytometry measurements are in there. This is clinical flow cytometry, already exists in EHR systems. Here we went deeper, Tom, Navi, Ben, Zicheng, and Sachit are all involved with this work. This paper is under review, but we realized when we look at UCSF's data, 40,000 patients already with a clinical flow cytometry measurement. So what can we do with that? I mean, these are pretty detailed, and you know they're not run on normal healthy people. This is an expensive test clinically. So they're gonna be run on folks who have some issue with their immune system, let's say HIV or uh, other conditions. But because you have so many across ages, race, ethnicity, what can we do with those kinds of measurements? Why don't we compare them against the 10,000 immunomes, which is what I showed you at the beginning. I showed you 10,000 normal healthy folks who haven't had flow cytometry measurements from import. Why don't we compare all the clinical flow cytometry measurements to all of them? And so you have to really be creative sometimes when you're a data person, figure out what question do I wanna ask here? What we wanted to do is look across disease and health and look at particular uh, confounders. I'm gonna skip this one. But CMV status, for example, patients can be CMV positive or negative across many different ages, races, and ethnicities and diseases. And we're able to now study CMV across clinical conditions with actual existing flow cytometry measurements compared to uh, 10, uh, 10K immunomes. And here, for example, we notice when you have CMV, it is associated with an increase in CD8 positive cells, decrease in CD4 positive, nothing surprising there, but CD19 and CD56 in several other conditions with compromised immunity. So you can start to look at confounders, you can look at viruses and effects, EBV, CMV, across diseases when you have this kind of huge number. So I think we've shown this in poster form before. I think this paper will eventually come out at some point. Uh, but then to even go further, I think we can start to use this data and predict the future for an immune patient, right? Uh, autoimmune condition, uh, we had this paper out, which I'm not gonna go into detail with deep learning and machine learning AI, but it's certainly the future what it means to predict the future for a patient. Here, with rheumatoid arthritis, particularly a nasty condition uh, to have, uh, where flares seem like uh, patients have flares just randomly, we can start to predict who's going to have a flare, let's say in the next 90 days, and we can validate that across the health systems. Uh, so Bo Nojo had this paper out maybe a year or two ago. And that's the direction we're trying to get into, is trying to predict the future for patients. We have a lot of use for this kind of data, but I'm going to end with what am I trying to do with all this data? I'm trying to build maps, maps of death and disease in California. Now that sounds kind of morbid, 
How do patients die in the state of California? I think it's useful to build these maps. Hannah and Jay did this work. It's been published now. Uh, so what does it mean? Well, these are not experts making the map. We're learning these maps from the disease, right? You might have cells that are actually progressing through time. These are patients that are progressing through time. So on the top left there, we have many patients that show up with alcoholism and alcohol-induced mental disorders. A year later, right, each arrow is a year, they might come with liver disease and cirrhosis, and then they might zip over to the left and have liver abscesses. So each arrow is one year, and the squares mean that you're dying of those conditions. So it's really hard to die of alcoholism, but it's much easier to die in our view, uh, in our hands with liver abscess or liver cirrhosis, right? Okay, so here's a more complicated one. You start on the left, acute myocardial infarction is a heart attack. Most people know what a heart attack is. You can die right away or go up to the top there with heart failure. The heart now is so weak as a pump, it cannot pump as much as it's supposed to. And then a year after that, you have in orange lung disease because the fluid is backing up in the lungs. And the year after that, you're in the blue circle on the right, which is septicemia, right? A body-wide bacterial or uh, other type of infection. Now, I thought that was kind of interesting. I admit I was trained as a pediatrician. So I didn't really take care of a lot of patients with heart attacks, but I always guessed that if you had a heart attack, it was the heart that killed you in the end. And I'm amazed how many of our patients are dying of the infection in the end. And why am I that surprised? Because when that post heart attack patient is at home with a fever, are we super concerned they might be having sepsis? I'm not really sure we are uh, because we've got the cardiologists all over this, not the immunologists and the infectious disease docs here, right? And it's particularly bad because if you don't take the Northern route on this map, you can take the Southern route, knock at your kidney and end up in sepsis a year faster, okay? So you got two ways to get the sepsis. And this is what I mean by data-driven map, right? No experts here. The computer, the algorithms can look at all this and figure out this happens and this happens and this happens. And the point of a map then is to figure out where are our patients and what's gonna happen next to them, right? That's the whole point. But I don't wanna just build these maps. I mean, the maps are pretty, but I actually wanna see where are our patients on the map? This is a prototype of real California data as patients are getting older. This is literally how patients are moving from disease to disease to disease to death. A whole bunch of them are gonna get sepsis in that purple circle in a moment and die. There they go. It's okay to chuckle. And the future now is how do we predict, can we predict what's gonna happen in the next 90 days? Can we predict what's gonna happen in the next year? And what are we gonna do about it? And that to me is gonna be the new definition of an accountable care organization, one that uses all this tools, talent and data to know and to predict and to really manage the care of all 8 million of its patients. And that's what I'm really proud of building in the University of California. I have to thank an enormous number of collaborators in my Stanford days, UC, UCSF days, of course, NIH and NIAID, a whole bunch of folks who build the database at UCSF that lets us go deep in patient care and all across the University of California make all this data happen every single day. Every grad student, postdoc at University of California can access the data on the cloud to start to do clinical data research. I thank UCSF Priscilla Chan, Mark Zuckerberg, and the Baker Foundation for all their naming gifts and uh, endowment support. And my lab has been blessed with 20 NIH grants from these 11 institutes of NIH. The ones in blue give me more money. The ones in orange give me less money, but I still love them. The FDA, the governor's office, lots of other disease-specific foundations who give us money to work on their diseases. I always thank my admin and tech staff on the right there. I'd never get a paper or grant out the door without their help. I always thank my family and all the folks who have hired me and keep me in a job uh, and mentor me uh, and have been mentoring me throughout my career. Uh, so thank you very much. And I think I left some time for questions before I order my Uber. Thank you. Any questions? So I says one. Yeah. I'm gonna, I have a couple, but I guess uh, <laughs> we spend a lot of time thinking about standards for air seek data, D cell vectors, T cell vectors, and how to get people to adopt those standards. And all your eight million data points, a lot of them will have air seek data, or because you know for CLL and minimal residual disease, or for right. CAR T cells looking for expanded T cell clones, is but. 
you know, those data aren't in those databases. Do you have any advice or how do we? Yeah, we got to get these to be clinical tests. I think, so right now we don't have any research data in there. Each campus has their own research data research and researchers. Mm -hmm. And we want to put researcher data in, into these repositories, at least starting university like UCSF, UCLA first. Yeah, so we have, uh, some of those are clinical tests. So minimum research yeah, 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 disease yeah, ones right, are right. actually so clinical tests. Research, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, um, I know, again, conflict of interest, but personnel does this, Garden does this, or many companies that are doing uh, some of those. Uh, right now, we don't have those, but those are on the list. So we're going to go after Tempest and Gardent, and then some of the uh, smaller ones after that. Uh, not all of them are actual sequences per se either, right? The companies don't necessarily give us raw sequences. Foundation gives us at least, they don't really give us a BAM file, but they at least give us the XML format of what they've found. Um, so the intent is absolutely there to do it. On the other side, though, we're waiting for use cases, right? You, you can't, it's, you know, if you've ever built a repository, built a computation tool, there is no such thing as build it and they will come, right? You've got to really spoon feed people with, with this stuff. Uh, so we really trying to handhold people to using the cancer data uh, and some of these other uh, measurements as well. But that's absolutely the uh, intent to get there. I can switch to your side, sure. Yeah, thank you. Very nice talk. Um, so the, the part where you went from the heart disease to the lung, the sepsis was really interesting. Um, do you know how much of the sepsis, the cause of death becomes ARDS and how much of the lung that goes to the sepsis is pulmonary heart hypertension? That's a great question. I mean, so we could go, because we have to remember every dose of every drug, uh, we have, for example, every ejection fraction from every echo across UC, right? We can parse them out of text files. Uh, the question's a great one. I don't know the answer, uh, but the data is certainly there to help answer the question. Ah, cool. It's a great question. Great. Fun. PFTs, we can parse out. Echoes, we can parse out. Uh, and we put those, but parse out means we, they, they start as text files and then we can put them into structured data elements uh, to help answer a question like that. Please. That was simply amazing. <laughs> um, I, and, 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 and the breadth that was explored was equally amazing. And you brought to stark light uh, the amount of investments which have been made in areas such as EMRs, uh, amongst other things. I'd, I'd like to zoom on and into something a little bit more practical. Um, uh, the example you gave of the heart patient who eventually succumbs to septicemia. Yes. Very interesting. Now, how, how do we, in your opinion, now that we have the tech and we all these billions of dollars have been invested, bridge the gap between these two disciplines. And in, in, in this case, you know, the cardiologist and back there, what's happening right. with, with the patient, the data is available, the platforms are available. In your opinion, if we as a community had to do one thing, yeah. what would that one thing be? Look, I'm not in the community. I can be provocative here uh, to a room full of academics, but I'm going to say start more companies, right? So don't just let it die with the paper, right? We got this glorious finding and here's a p-value and maybe it's a nice data viz and I've seen lots of amazing data viz, right, this, this day, right? But now make it to the company, right? Because clinicians can then use it and then it comes full circle back in the EHR, right? I mean, then it's there. Uh, if you really believe what you're finding is real, right, then actually take it the one next step. And it might not be you, it might be someone else, it might be uh, someone you're licensing it to, but don't hesitate to do that next step. At least now I'm gonna speak for the United States, especially United States medical school faculty. We are encouraged to do this. Most of us have these standard rules we have to follow for conflict of interest, can't do research on our patients, the usual kind of things, but we're encouraged to start companies like this. I mean, it, it's not, you don't have to be ashamed of that. I'm not, I'm no longer ashamed to talk about companies like that, right? That second slide that I show, to a lot of doctors, that's their slide of shame. That's my slide of significance, right? That is the whole point is I want to actually get this out of the lab to actually try to help folks. And I encourage all of you to do the same thing. Don't let it die with the paper. Go for it. Um, so my this Uber's is not here yet, so go for it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try to be quick. So this is more of a, a health infrastructure question. Um, so when you talked about genomics, personalis, so the difference between personalis from what I remember and foundation is foundation is a clinical test. That's right. So when we're talking about clinical exomes or genomes, how do we get those paid for? Yes. Okay, so, those, so actually personalis is a clinical test, so is Garden, so are all of these now. They're all clinical tests, which means they gotta get CLIA and then CAP approval. Mm -hmm. So that's the minimum standard. And then you gotta get payer coverage, right? And so either you do all the hard work like foundation did to get CMS, which is Medicare and Medicaid to so pay for it. And then everyone says, okay, we're like them, right? Which is a lot easier for the second and the follow-ons. 
Uh, uh, or you could set this up as a lab-based test, which is a little bit easier to get into, uh, where people sell, sell, send you samples and then you can do it. So there's, there's strategies to get these paid for faster and then more comprehensively. Uh, but in the end, you got to demonstrate that clinicians are going to make a difference with this result in the end, right? And in the end, that actually someone might actually uh, improve healthcare. So outcomes have got to be better. If you can show that docs are going to make a difference with uh, change the care based on a result and the outcomes are different, usually the approval side of this is not hard. Then it's a matter of creatively setting the price, which people can make a lot of mistakes here too. Uh, can I have a quick follow up? Sure. So if we're looking at a test where the value proposition for the patient and doctor is 20 years down the line, the assumption is they're going to have different insurance companies, right? So absolutely right. And so at the same time, it's very hard to do a 20 year test for folks, mm -hmm. okay, to prove that it's working. So a lot of life is about these shorter kinds of tests. And so, you know, we, we have the Illumina here, which now owns Grail and Grail is looking at long term, let's say, mm -hmm. uh, cancer risk, there are a lot of companies working on that. Those are tough studies to run. They take a lot of money to run, a lot of time, a lot of existing samples, samples from 10 years ago, where are they now kind of thing. Um, and the value prop is going to be a lot harder. Uh, to, but that's, that's, the, that's the battle. That's the game I think folks be, think they're going, they're going to win. So that is it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, you know, yeah, so if you could go back in time, maybe to the beginning of import, yeah. can we imagine, uh, let's say NIAID said, well, here's some import money, but we're going to force a cell ontology on you or something. Was there much discussion of that? Would that have Oh, worked? there's a lot of discussion about all that stuff. Cell ontologies and stuff. We had Barry Smith involved in the first five, uh, 10 years of this. Um, it doesn't really change much. You only have 500 data sets here. So in the end, you have the folks who know what to do with this data and really know what they want to ask and answer can figure out the cells here, right? And no one's going to really even believe what we label these cells. They're going to rerun them. They're going to regate them. Some folks have done that. So in the end, you can, there's a whole concept of boiling the ocean, right? You make it perfect and spend a lot of time trying to make things perfect at the beginning uh, and then get nowhere fast. Or do you actually get, try your best, put some kind of ontology out there and do it. The data model, for example, the patients here uh, is its own it's a custom data model because it predates FDA C-DISC. It really, uh, OMOP wasn't really around. Uh, so like we had to make decisions, this was, you know, even prior teams, right? That had to make decisions with import. It's not perfect. There is a crude ontology there. We tried to go further, but even NIAD lost interest at some point in trying to make it perfect. Better to get some data out there. The fastest way to slow down data release is to say, I need it to be perfect, right? Well, I mean, Those of you who run repositories know that. I guess it depends on what you mean by perfect. I mean, it's just, I think about it pretty simply. I mean, you know, well, we all have to put gender in column three. That's I mean, right. You know, to some degree. I'll give you another hard one, right? So even the transplant world, where did the kidney come from? Okay, some say family member, which family member, right? Some actually are more detailed than that. Was it the mom, was it the wife, so the husband? Right, so uh, sibling, sister, right? I mean, so um, the people chose different ones in their studies. So we try to harmonize there as much as we can. You could do a common denominator, but if we were to wait to set up all those standards at the beginning, the trials would still be running, right? So there's, we, there's a certain point, 80-20 rule, you do the best you can and then the, the study runs and then you release what you have. All right, folks, I think I gotta go. Thank you very much for having me.